the Q&A Tech School. This is the Q&A Tech School. This is the first video podcast that I'm doing. This is presented by Quanda Entertainment. I'm your host, Jonathan Kyle Hobson. The Q&A Tech Show, the first today's class, we're going to talk about the future of entertainment. Our discussion is on 360 video. We'll have a guest star. And let's go to the next scene here. So here I am, Kyle, and I'm going to introduce Kevin. This is Kevin. I'm going to introduce him more a little bit in the soon here. First, I'm going to talk about the show structure. So typically, um, the Q&A Tech School is going to have two different kind of structures. We're going to have a discussion, and we're going to have a lesson. This show will be discussion format. In the future, we'll have lesson formats where I'll, I'll teach software or how to use a camera um, and so, for example, next week we're having, on uh, Thursday next week, we're having a class on manual settings for the camera. And so there'll be two different kinds of discussions, two different kinds of classes, and we'll broadcast Thursday and Friday. Typically, we'll have a lesson on Thursday morning and a discussion on Friday. Next, we'll, um, <clears throat> we'll move to describing what today's topic is. So, but first, before that, I want to show an intro uh, from the ThinkSpot. So I'm broadcasting live at the ThinkSpot. Uh, Sphinx Spots at the Red Mountain Mesa Library. You're welcome to come in person during the Q&A portion. If you have any questions on vi 360 video, you're welcome to come in person and ask them. We already have one person here. You can't see her on video yet. Um, and I'll introduce her later. But anyway, you can come in person or you can submit questions on social media, so on, on Facebook, on YouTube. Kevin, our helper here. Our tech person is uh, is um, chatting with you on on Facebook and chatting you with on you with on YouTube. Okay, so we'll go to the next scene here. Okay, so Quanda three today on the Q and A Tech School, we're going to talk about three hundred and sixty video, three hundred and sixty photography, everything dealing with three hundred and sixty, even a little bit of VR. Three hundred and sixty is basically a virtual spherical image. And if you have 360 video, you have multiple of those images. And basically a 360 camera, usually a rig, or nowadays you have cameras that do it all in one, in one camera. It has two lenses. And these are super ultra-wide lenses. And basically it records the whole environment all at once. And then you have this, you have multiple um, shots from all different angles, and you use a software program to stitch all those shots together, and it gives you a super wide panorama, almost fish eye looking. Then you use another conversion software to convert that into something you can explore, like a 360 environment. So we'll get to examples later on. We have some demos to show you, and we have some other, other exciting things to go over. I also have my guest star, Kit Dotson, who will also be talking about uh, 360 video with me here shortly. So, um, <clears throat> let's go to our next scene here. Okay, so we have uh, Kevin here. I'm supposed to show Kevin and us, but we'll start with Within the Frame since you already saw Kevin. Kevin owns his own channel, Within the Frame. He, uh, he broadcasts live uh, currently Fridays at 11 a.m., but I think you're moving to 4. Yeah, we'll be moving to 4 in a couple weeks. Okay. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what that is? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Within the Frame is a movie discussion and review uh, channel. So we have a host, and we're picking up a second host starting this Friday. And they, uh, they discuss movies, and they, they do a focus on Arizona movies. Great. Okay, so check out Kevin's channel, um, Within the Frame. And uh, do you have a URL or anything? Uh, just... If you go to YouTube and check out and do a search for Within the Frame, it'll take you right there. Perfect. Okay, so we'll move on. I'm going to introduce Kit Dotson. You can see him on the screen now. Kit has his mic muted currently, so he'll unmute it. Um, Kit, how are you doing? Do we have you yet, Kit? There you go. Uh, so, Kit, you um, you write a couple you write a couple of books, don't you? Uh, you have um, you're an author. You have several um, books and short stories you've written. Uh, two most recent works were Vulnerable and Invincible, am I correct? That's correct. Right. And uh, it seems like you have a following for the Spectre in the Spectacles. Am I saying that right? Yes, you are. What's that about? 
Uh, the Spectre and the Spectacles is sort of an urban fantasy novel about a kid who discovers that fairies are real. Great. Uh, that sounds really cool. So it's basically like for anybody who is really interested in like fantasy and um, and mythical creatures and all that, right? Yeah. Perfect. And so you also run your own live stream, is that correct? Yes, that's very true. What is your live stream? How can we get to it? Uh, my live stream is called MMO Anthropology, and if you can uh, spell that. It's all one word. It's on Twitch TV. We broadcast Friday and Saturday evenings around 8 o'clock on Arizona time, which is always mountain time. Oh, perfect. So, you know, it's kind of the same as Pacific time, because we don't have daylight savings. <laughs> Yeah, and I also have the links to uh, to all Kit's stuff below in the in the description of this video, so you can get access to Kit's uh, Kit's uh, live stream on YouTube from there. He plays live streams on Twitch, but he has a YouTube channel that he also puts videos on. Uh, Kit Dawson Kit Dawson's also a senior editor at Silicon Angel, right? Uh, Silicon Angle. Silicon Angle. Okay, I. Yeah. Uh, so we have a little bit the sound. We go up a little bit. For for Dotson. Dotson, your sound needs to go up a little bit. Let's see if you can get oh. you louder. Okay, well I can Is that better? I can shout louder into the microphone. Is he coming through the mic? Uh, I think he is. He's just coming in a lower volume than so me. So you're not running the sound through that computer from him? No. Um Okay, so he's done a lot of research in the field uh for Silicon Angle. Um, you've written a lot of 360 and VR articles, and we're gonna just we're gonna dive right in and discuss that. Thank you for joining us today in today's discussion kit, and I think we'll go right in. So we'll go to scene five here. Okay, so now you can see me and Kit on the screen, and over next to us is a demo of Quanda of Quanda's 360 video. It's on YouTube right now. If you're listening via audio only, or even if you're watching the video, I suggest that you go over and watch our Quanda 360 video on YouTube. Uh, this is a recording of me watching the video from my phone. So this this isn't in 360, but this is as as you pans around, that's what you can do yourself when you're watching the video. Does that does that make sense? Um. So for so I shot this last month. Uh, in China, um, Quanda Entertainment went to China, and I used the Ricoh Theta S. I've had it for a few months, and I shot these these 360 videos, and there we were doing some Tai Chi. Uh, and the the 360 camera is the Ricoh 360. I think is a popular camera, but I think it outshines a lot of better cameras. Um, like for example, the LG 360. I think is a is a probably a slightly better camera, at least on a paper. But the Ricoh 360 did a really good advertising campaign, and they do have a quality camera. It shoots really nice photography. I would say it's more for 360 photography than anything else. Um, as you can see on the video, the, the 360 photography, that's a photography shot, is usually higher quality than the videos. The videos shoot at 1080p on this camera, and that's a problem because when you're converting that 1080p video into a spherical image, you lose a lot of quality because you're zooming in, you're distorting, you're, un you're compressing, and you're doing a lot of steps that definitely, if you don't have the best software, then you're gonna lose a lot of quality. So a 360 camera, it's really important to have 4K, I would say, and I'm usually not an opponent of 4K, um, but with 360, having 4K, 8K, I think is, is, a, is a necessary. What do you think, Kit? I'd say that I agree with that because the more uh, the more pixels that you're putting in there, the more uh, distortion that you can get out of the way when you're dealing with cameras that, for example, only have two lenses. Because the fisheye nature means that the closer to the edge you get, the wider the pixels become, which increases the distortion. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I think, I think I agree with that. Like, I, and I think that I think that like that quality just really. Um, and here's Kevin Dixon fixing uh, Nick Kitt's audio. His audio is still a little, little down because we're trying to. There's no way for me to stream the Google Hangouts directly into the stream, so I, yeah, his audio has to go through the mic here. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's like it's it makes a makes a big difference the quality level 
having really high quality 360 video is really good for VR, and that lower quality can just can just can just cause VR issues if you're watching it on a VR camera. I mean, on a VR headset. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about more options here in a moment. And we're, we're, so, like with the Rico, though, I want to talk about a few more things about it. So I've also noticed that when I'm shooting Kit, um, the Rico has this red dot that is on the is on the scene. And it, whenever you're shooting outside or in bright light, there's this red dot, and it's a it's a it's a sun flare on the lens, but it's always there, and it's really annoying. It almost looks like a pixel died in the camera. Um, do you have any thoughts on like what what what's causing that? Uh, well, not knowing the hardware, it's hard to speak about, but it sounds like it is, in fact, a lens flare. Since the camera probably has multiple lenses in order to get the, the widest view that it possibly can, chances are some of the light is reflecting off of an inner lens and then back off of an outer one, and the camera is seeing that. Okay. Yeah, because it, it just really bothered me, and I, for a while there, I was like, my, my like, my, um camera had a dead pixel and I was like I had to do all this research and I found out that it was just the sun flare and it was really scary there for a minute but yeah but otherwise I think the 360 is awesome and over here now you can see next to us that we have um that we're showing actual live footage from the not 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 currently but like from when I was uh testing the 360 camera earlier like last week I recorded on the 360 on my phone and the 360 has Wi-Fi, so it connected to my phone, and then I can see what it's viewing in live stream, and then I can take pictures with it, and I can do it from all control it from my phone. So on the on the 360 itself, it doesn't have any ability really to change settings. You can take a you can take a photograph shot with the button right there, and you can uh, and it blinks and everything like that. I can turn it on right now, and you can see it recording and so forth. Um, but it, but other than that, you can't really control settings. But on your phone, you can change the ISO, you can change the white balance, you can change different variables of it. And so as you can see here, I'm, I'm like recording video from my phone. I started the recording, but you can also click the button on the camera to start the recording. And we can record some video right now. So I'm recording right now 360 video. And um, you can see how the light's blinking and so it tells you. And then you can also live stream with the, with the Rico on a computer, um, though that can get, that can get, pretty complicated since it isn't perfected yet. Because um, I always have an issue in live streaming that the quality is even lower because it's at 720p unless you have an HDMI cable going into your computer, which you can't easily do. Um, but yeah, so you can see I took that picture back in the day and you can see like you can see me moving around on the phone and so that's a good um, way to do it. Have you ever uh, messed with the Ricoh 3 Theta S uh, kit? No, I haven't had a chance. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a pretty nice camera, but I'm definitely um, going to um, upgrade to a, to a nicer one eventually, more expensive one. The, three, the Ricoh is about like $350, um, give or take, and this is a case that was extra that's on here. But it's a good camera. Um, so what else about 360 do we really need to know, Kit? What, what else should, should, the, should our um, audience know? Well, for the most part, uh, a lot of it is going to come down to what camera that you choose to work with. There's a lot of consumer edition cameras out right now that are trying their best to keep the price down by having as few cameras as possible, which means two cameras. And when you're only working with two cameras, there are uh, kind of blind spots in the stitching that are really close to the device. So a lot of the time when you're taking 360 video, you want to make sure that the device is uh, further away from the subjects than, uh, you know, than where you want to be. You can see it on uh, Kyle's footage because it's cutting his hand off in a really weird way. And that's because while the two cameras have a little bit of overlap so that they stitch correctly, the overlap occurs further away from the actual camera. But the more... But that doesn't mean that more cameras always means a better experience. It just means that there are a lot of the, the solutions that are cheaper are using tricks, uh, you know, in order to make it so that it's more affordable. And so you have to be aware of the inherent, uh, fl um, you know, liabilities or flaws of that particular system that you're working with. So one of the things you want to do is anytime that you're studying a camera or you get a new one is try different uh 
look at the way that things look at different distances and just, you know, run it through paces like you would a new car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And over over next to us, we have um, different options of cameras, consumer cameras and uh, semi-pro cameras that are available on the market. Um, these cameras are like $100 to $1,000 range. And um, we have the 360 Fly, um, the Kodiak, Pix Pro 4K. And so there's so many options out there. And Kit's right. you got to really like um, do your research and know what the pros and cons of each of these cameras are. And usually if you go cheaper, you're going to have a little bit more issues with your camera. But I think the market's starting to get it's still fresh. And it's still very, very new. And even though there's a lot of cameras out there, a lot of them are only semi-good um, in the in the consumer range. And so, but there, by the end of fall, there's going to be a lot more cameras. Like some of these cameras that are on this on these pictures aren't even out yet. Um, like the Key Mission, I think, comes out next month, the Nikon Key Mission. And that one's a sports camera. It's waterproof, dustproof, um, and so it can be docile around and it's impact-proof to a certain extent. And so that's a, that's a camera for for, uh, for for sports. And so there's a lot of good quality ones that are coming out. And you even have like the Insta 360, which can work with your phone. I'm not I'm not sure if it works with the, with only iPhone or for other phones as well. As far as I know, it works only with the iPhone. And then you also have the Samsung 360 that works with um, Samsung phones only if they don't explode on you. But uh, but yeah, so the Samsung 360 is a really good camera. I've heard um, it's okay. Uh, and then there's the Nico 360. Am I saying that right, Kit? Yeah, I, I think that's how it's pronounced. Well, Kit, Kit's written about the Nico 360. Um, can you tell us some more about the Nico 360? If I, if I recall correctly, the Nico 360 was an Indiegogo campaign that one uh, the very bottom. funded uh, camera that was sold as extremely rugged and insanely small. This is a very, very tiny camera that is supposed to be rugged that they want people to be able to just hike out somewhere with it in their pocket, pull it out, and then, uh, you know, uh, take shots with it. And I think it runs, the pre-order price right now is around $150. And it's also waterproof, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's waterproof. Uh, one of the selling points is that it is rugged. They, they do, uh, Nico 360 does a lot of marketing showing people out hiking, like in the wilderness uh, showing off vistas and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that's a really cool camera, and it's only like a hundred dollars or so, hundred and fifty. So it's a lot cheaper than the um and the Rico. Does it shoot four K or ten eighty P? Because I or because I saw convicting um notes online, I couldn't find out if it shot four K or not. Uh, I've only seen uh, something saying that it was at ten eighty P, but okay. it is a twenty four megapixel camera, so uh, it could possibly it could probably do four K. Yeah, because I also I also saw like I saw pictures on on um saw a picture on Google Images that that showed four K, um capability, but that that could have been someone just you know editing a photo. <laughs> um, but yeah, so next to us now we have professional cameras. Now these guys range from like what ten ten thousand dollars and up. Like they're they're um, really expensive, and we have um, a lot of them are custom built rigs. Like the Facebook camera, uh, what's the name of it? Um, but that one that one is Facebook posted on how to build it, and that one you have to build yourself or have a company build it for you. So Facebook doesn't actually make the product; it just it just developed how to make it, and then you got to make it yourself. And then we also have a more complex GoPro rig, and we have um, another Nikon professional camera, uh, and then then we have the what is it called the light the light flight flow or light camera? Light Pro Emerge. It's light the one that looks like a Death Star. It's a uh, it's kind of in the middle, right above the three sixty swirl. Yeah, and that one that one doesn't exist yet, but it but when it does, that's going to be incredible. I mean. That that like um, captures reality at a whole different level than a normal camera does. So throw out everything you know about a typical camera, and you have this one. So this one basically captures. If I have it correct, and Kit probably knows more, he'll correct me if I'm wrong. But this one basically captures every little light spectrum that comes at it, and it captures all the different light spectrums, and it creates almost um, a virtual reality world out of the environment. 
So then you can go in and edit it like it's an animation, edit it like it's a video game, um, and change things and so forth. Am I, am I correct, Kit? Yeah, you're you're very close, actually. The, the, the trick of the Lytro cameras is that they're called a light field camera, which is why you don't see any lenses on it. The entire surface that you're looking at there is actually a camera surface. The way that light field capture works is that not only does it detect the incoming light ray, but it can also record the angle that the light ray is striking the surface at, which allows you to then uh, oh. simulate what the scene looks like by knowing the angle and the color of the light, uh, which is why you can why it allows you to get an idea of what might what an object might be looking look like in three dimensions uh, rather than where a normal camera is just a flat plane that detects the strike of, of a light ray but doesn't know the angle that it approached at. Yeah, and, and that allows you to also have every single distance in focus, theoretically, yep. and then also yep. allows you to change that focus as you want in editing. So this, this like new kind of camera adds so many more capabilities to, uh, to the media world, and I think it's another evolutionary step in in media and it's really interesting to see how we've progressed with cameras and technology and media because it's like things slowly advanced but at this like at this amazing incredible rate and it's it's going to be amazing when that when that technology really starts to get moving which won't be probably for like 10 years or five years now before we start seeing it in the hands of the consumer but i mean in the hands of hollywood you could probably see that in the, you know three or four years um if whenever they get this camera out so um, so yeah, so we're gonna go on, and here we're now we're gonna talk about the possibilities of uh, VR in 360. So this is the, this is the area that I'm really passionate about. I'm very abstract when it comes to technology. I'm very technical, but I also talk about things in a very abstract method. So this is my kind of area. Um, so like 360 video is only one step to VR. It's not it's not VR itself. Uh, it can be watched independently from VR. But it's a process to getting VR video. I mean, to getting, yeah, getting VR video. So with 360, you can now put that into a VR headset, and you can even further enhance that experience by making that 360 3D. And I forgot to mention before, we have the views. I always pronounce it wrong, but I think it's the views or the Vuzz, which comes out um, soon. It's V-U-Z-E. And that one, um, it shoots 3D and 360. So it's the first kind of consumer camera designed for VR headsets. Um, so with 3D and 360, you really get that, that, that VR experience. Um, and VR is just so amazing. When you really have a high quality VR headset and you can put that on, people literally start thinking they're in that reality. And it also distorts your sense of time. It can distort everything to the point where I've heard stories about people being in VR um, for a day and only feeling a few minutes past. Um, because not only they get so engaged in whatever, whatever they're interacting with, but also the, because the person creating the VR story controls time, they can change literally your sense of reality, how you perceive time. So your mind starts perceiving time differently and, it, and you get confused. And, that, that's, um, and that, that, there's a, um, a lot of research being done on that and how time affects the human mind. And so that's something that VR... That's one of the possibilities of VR is research, trying to trying to figure out what the difference between human consciousness is and um, reality, and how our consciousness changes our reality. Um, but that's kind of getting a little bit philosophical. If we come back to more practical stuff, VR can be used in the medical field. Um, VR can be used for NASA training, as you can saw, see a photo there just now. VR um, can be used for military training. Um, we also have uh, VR full body suits, VR gloves, and those all enhance the experience. We also have VR eye tracking. Kit, can you tell us a little bit about VR eye tracking? Well, one of the one of the things about uh, virtual reality headsets is interfaces, and one of the problems with interfaces is that it's on your face in the case of a VR headset. And uh, part of the way that humans interact with the world is we look at it. Not, not only do we look at it by moving our head, but we move our eyes. And so one of the problems with virtual reality headsets is that giving people the right focal lengths, because in front of them it's a pair of screens, to match where their eyes are looking is a problem. 
So being able to track where a person's pupils are aimed will it allow a headset to better uh, modify the view so that it looks natural. Because um, a VR headset is basically just a pair of screens right in front of your eyes. And this, just like a computer monitor in front of you does not adjust its focal length because your eyes are looking at a particular part of the screen, a VR headset has a very similar problem. Except that because it's right in front of your eyes and it's trying to pretend to, to be an actual field of view, the fact that fo uh, the focus doesn't change can be a little bit disturbing. And uh, it, it causes problems with uh, the concept of immersion that uh, the virtual reality headsets are, are, are attempting to generate. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, eye tracking will definitely change that. That Again, another be another step in evolution of technology that will really dramatically change the field of VR and allow um, that combined with light flow technology will just dramatically increase the point. Some people say that the VR will get so realistic that you won't know the difference between reality and VR and virtual reality until you take off the headset. Um, so, and then, and then also you have augmented reality, which you're combining those two fields, those two universes, and you're interacting with rea real reality and virtual reality at the same time. So it's, it's going to be really amazing. And I think, I think that like, um, there's just so many possibilities. And one other thing I want to talk about is interactive stories. So like VR will dramatically change the way we make movies. So you have, right now you have movies, you have video games, and both of those can be in VR. Um, video games, you know, you're playing them in VR, and that will be incredible. Interactive stories, I would say, is like an in-between those two. It's like a movie, but it's a movie where you kind of decide where the movie goes. So um, imagine like a future where there's theaters, and you and your friend can go, and I think there's a few pictures of them where you saw people with VR headsets in a theater. But, um, and you can go and you can watch a VR movie out with your friends. But not only can you watch this VR movie out with your friends, but it also has a little, the movie has augmented reality combined with it. So you can mess with your friend and you guys can mess with the story of the video. So the, the, the movie. So the movie, a character in the movie may ask you to pass a wine and you may be a character in the movie. And if you refuse to pass the wine, then it may change the complete story of the movie. So you're not actually, it's like those old interactive written stories, the first video games that ever came out, the first RPG games. So I guess in a way it is an RPG, but at the same time it's a movie. So it's like its own little um, genre of media. And then also um, uh, therapy, me medical reasons, like, ther like therapeutic reasons. You know, um, there's so many possibilities there. Getting someone off of a phobia, someone who's like afraid of something. You can slowly introduce them via VR and it may reduce their fear uh, via exposure of a certain uh, impractical fear or phobia of something in, in society or um, helping with social anxiety or um, maybe I could have practiced a show on VR beforehand. <laughs> um, so there's all sorts of possibilities with VR. And I want to go back for a second because, uh, Kit, you had a few more things to mention that we skipped over. Um, like, uh, how can someone watch VR? Where do they go to watch VR or, or a 360 video? Well, 360 video a little bit easier than, than straight up VR right now, but there's uh, a lot of websites are working into the idea that a lot of 360 video is video. So any sites that already did video are pushing out uh, their 360 uh, augments, so to speak. Uh, like uh, Facebook has a 360 video section, YouTube has YouTube 360, and of course uh, Oculus, the Oculus Store and uh, Steam VR half sections for 360 video, and then there's also a website called Zeality, which wants to be a 360 video publishing platform. And uh, but for most people, a lot of 360 video is going to go back into the same place that it has. It's going to tend to come from, which I think is mobile devices. So things like Samsung VR, Google Cardboard, and uh, Apple's version of the of the VR headset that uses your phone are probably where a lot of people are going to use and consume things like 360 video uh, and 360 um, imagery uh, at right now because also primarily because it's the, the cheapest way to do it. If you already have a smartphone, 
it's only a fifth, you know, a ten to a hundred dollar headset turns that into a VR headset. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, and there's also the Google Cardboard. I was going to show you an example yeah. Oh, yeah. because the ThinkSpot has one, but I forgot about it. But um, but yeah, if you come to the ThinkSpot, that's just another reason for you to come to the ThinkSpot, guys. Um, is there's a there's a, a Google Cardboard VR headset, which is a really cheap headset. It's like a basically made out of cardboard and glass. And you can put your phone in there, like like Ket saying, and you can you can get a sense of the VR experience. It's nowhere near as good as having, you know, the Oculus Rift or some really expensive VR headset. But it gives you some 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 adjustment, and it does have a lot of issues. Like even I, with that cheap VR Google cardboard thing, even I experience some headaches with uh, with the eye movements. But if you can get, but it, but it gives you a sense of it, and it's really cool. Like um, you know, I watched a scary. Uh, 360 video on there once and I was actually literally scared um, you know of it and it felt like that person was approaching me so even though it's cheap you still get immersed in that reality so it just kind of gives you an idea of how when the real technology comes out to the everyday user it's going to be incredible and there might be some issues with that confusion between reality and not reality and also again probably gun violence in video games and movies will probably be a topic that people will be concerned about um but is there anything else we missed, Kit? Um, anything else you wanted to mention specifically? Let's see here. No, I think we covered most of what I would have covered. Okay, perfect. Well, I think we'll go to the next shot here, which is which is uh, which is Q and A time. So, um, so now we're going to Kit and me and Kevin are going to answer some questions from uh, people who submitted questions. And uh, say your name again. Adriana Thomas. Adriana Thomas is here. Uh, if you want to come in the shot, you're welcome to. Uh, on time, to, on, yeah. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, she came in person to join our our uh, our our broadcast here, and so we are going to answer questions from the public. You can submit on social media, or you could you know beforehand or right now, and you can also ask questions in person. So Kevin is managing all that. So Kevin, what is uh, what are the few questions that you um, that people have submitted? Well, we have some questions that were asked throughout the week um, in preparation for this. Uh, the first question that was asked by uh, someone named Jim Carson was, where can I find and watch uh, VR virtual reality videos? So, Kit, you already talked about this some. Do you want to handle this question a little bit? Sure. So, uh, when it comes to 360 video and like general VR presentation, YouTube 360 and Facebook 360 is a really good source. And also, as I mentioned, Zeality, uh, Z-E-A-L-I-T-Y. It wants to be a publisher for not just 360 video, but VR videos that uh, also, a lot of the time, if you happen to have, you buy a headset, or if you get, say, a Samsung uh, Gear VR uh, headset that turns your phone into a headset, it will come with an application inside it that will give you access to the uh, to spaces that, that will give you access to virtual reality videos and et cetera, either through their own applications or through a platform that publishes those uh, VR 360 videos. Uh, for example, my Samsung Gear VR has the Oculus Store, and the Oculus Store is kind of like Google Play, but for VR apps and uh, you know, VR video and et cetera. Yeah, uh, exactly. And so I think that's, that's really... Um... Yeah, YouTube 360 is where I put all my stuff. Like, uh, um, Quantum Entertainment has its first VR video out that it released Tuesday. Um, that you can go on to uh, Quantum Entertainment and watch that VR video. But as um, as uh, Kit said, there's tons of sources out there, and there's always more reality, more coming out. And Z Reality is one dedicated to um, 360 video. And so, and then there's also educational experiences. I saw when I did some research on uh, iPhone. My iPhone, I looked up you know, 360 apps, viewing apps. There's like tons of educational ones that pop up for um, kids and stuff like that. So that the, in the educational environment, they're really trying to use VR and 360 video to teach kids about locations. And you can, because you can immerse yourself in other countries and other cultures and everything like that. Um, and first I want to ask, do you have any questions about 360 video? I have a charity mm -hmm. and we're going to be giving baby boxes statewide and then nationwide. And would be able to have a camera like this to be able to take when we deliver the boxes to be able for the sponsors 
to really see what what it's all about, what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Would this work for us? Um, yeah, I think I think that three sixty video would work for for anything really. I think um, I think that's a great idea. I mean, it really it really brings you into like the twenty first century, into the newest technology, right? And so you're doing something on the revolutionary, something that's not been done that often. Um, but oftentimes, too, three sixty. Got to keep in mind, three sixty is shooting a full three sixty field, so it's really really good if you have like a lot going on in that full 360 field. If you only have one thing that you want your subject to focus on, then maybe it's better to use a regular camera still um, because you're zoning in on that one thing you want them to see. But if you have like a warehouse of stuff and you have things piled all around the camera, then you can put that camera in the center of the room and really show everything that's going on. And then, then like people watching, people you're trying to get to donate or whatever, they can really see your operation and what's going behind the scenes and it really puts them it gives them a personal experience of what you're doing. So it's a really good way to get donators, I think. And definitely if you have a really high quality camera or maybe you do something unique with it, you know, kind of think about what you what your story wants to be, what you want to tell your audience, who your audience is and what they need to know and kind of do it all up, then I think that, that three sixty video can be really impactful. Uh, what do you what do you think, Kit? Well, I totally agree. Uh, in fact, I've seen numerous 360 videos that were taken from people who who were carrying the camera on something like a stabilized uh, selfie stick, who gave tours of locations that are either inaccessible or extremely distant by walking people through them in order to show them what it looks like. And the 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 benefit of the 360 video is that the audience is not trapped to the to the gaze of the camera, so. With a normal video camera, you're stuck with a, the, with a 2D idea of what the camera person wants you to look at and the, as they scan around. Now, this is useful, as uh, Kyle said, to, if you really want people to focus on, on, on a specific thing. But if you want to give people the ability to take it in how they want, as if they are you know, walking through a vista or they're in a forest, like... Or, uh, or even like a warehouse with a lot of interesting things for them to look at, then you're giving them the ability to look left or right or up or down uh, at any point when you're walking along. And it also gives you sort of a weird sort of to- virtual tour guide effect, where you could say if you look to your left, and then the person actually has to look to their left or, or move the, 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 the video facing, and it gives them a much more immersive sense, making them feel like they're there, rather than they're being drawn along uh, or being forced to view in a particular perspective. Exactly, and that that reminds me that like the V three sixty video is really big in real estate. That's where it actually got started. I think almost first is real estate uses three sixty video a lot, and um, and so you know you can like hire someone right now. Um, to go to a house and like shoot a 360 shot of each of your rooms. And there's programs online where you can actually like, you know, travel from room to room, kind of like Google Street. Google Street does that. And Google Street uses 360 cameras on their cars to capture, you know, Google Street View. And then you can also um, capture it yourself. You can like capture a Google Street View of outside your facility. So if you have like a location of business where you operate from, then you can, uh, Take a 360 video of that or 360 photo and upload it to Google Google um, Google Streets, and then Google Streets will put that on their on their um, uh, Google Earth, and people can go in and walk around your facility. And then you can also upload the inside of your facility to Google Streets as photos, and people can walk inside your store. So um, Google Streets is doing a lot of things to help market businesses with 360 photography, mostly. Um, but then it also 360 video um, is also a really good marketing tool as well. So, uh, uh, Kevin, what other questions do we have here? Uh, we have a question from, I'm not 100% on how to pronounce this, Carmen Draco. Uh, again, from earlier in the week, which was, what is the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? Uh, so, I'll let you handle this one, Kit. Okay, so this is actually uh, kind of easy. Uh, virtual reality is basically you're strapping a computer screen to your face and it is immersing you in a totally different reality. Everything about what you're seeing is being comp- is being generated by a computer. That's virtual reality. 
Augmented reality, on the other hand, is what it, what the computer is instead doing is it's overlaying computer-aided uh, graphics over your own vision of the world. So where a virtual reality headset cuts off your vision utterly, you can't see anything but the computer screen, a uh, augmented reality computer screen would be something that either is running off of a camera, so it's showing you what you would see already, or it's, or it's transparent, which means that you see through it, but it's able to add objects in your field of view. For example, in, in augmented reality Pokemon, if you had glasses that were like transparent uh, projectors, you look down at your kitchen table and you could see a Pikachu sitting on your kitchen table. And no matter where you move, the Pikachu would stay on the kitchen table and, and would appear to actually be sitting on it. And that's augmented reality. Yeah, like uh, uh, Pokemon Go is an amazing example of augmented reality. And that was a craze when it first came out. I mean, it just really shows you how augmented games can really be something that, that is the future. Um, and Pokemon Go, um, you know, lost a little bit of interest with their server in, it, with their server issues. But when they first came out, I was in there, you know, I captured as many Pokemon. And I'd go around with my camera, looking at all the Pokemon. And you could, like, go to your camera on Pokemon Go and see Pokemon on the table, like Kit was saying. So that's really fascinating. Um, do you have any other questions for us? No, I think this will be a great idea because it gives mm -hmm. the sponsors an opportunity to see it more reality. Yeah. Instead of just writing it or hearing it, they actually are seeing it, especially when we deliver it to on the way all over to the reservation, on the way there, and the scenery and so forth. Um, I think it will work for any business. Yeah, exactly. I think I think it's an incredible marketing tool. Do um, you have any more questions for us, Kevin? Uh, yeah, we do. We have uh, Rachel Turner. Uh, she asked, when will I start seeing more affordable virtual reality headsets? Yeah, so in the... Um, uh, so I talked to... I went to a, a VR club, AZ VR club in, uh, on meetup.com in Arizona recently, uh, a few weeks back or maybe about a month back. Uh, and I spoke to someone who's really heavily invested in VR and he works as an advisor for VR companies um, in, in Arizona, and he kind of bro broke down what his, what his uh, forecast of the future of VR is, and he says in a few years we'll start seeing more VR headsets in the house, in the houses and, and, in, and uh, in our environment, and definitely like PlayStation VR already has its VR headset, so the gaming industry will start developing VR headsets, and so in the next few years you should start seeing ones that are, you know, about as much as a cell phone is, you know, or a computer, and very reasonable, and then once uh, uh, Apple right now is working on their VR headset, and once they release about in about four years from now, uh, they he believed that the VR market's going to boom, and you're going to see VR start to see VR everywhere. Um, so, and then you're going to start seeing Hollywood get into VR, and Hollywood's really trying to get into VR right now. And there's actually a few theaters and theme parks that are VR theme parks. Um, so you can go to these theme parks and the rides and the environments are all virtual reality. And so you can go in and put yourself in like any kind of environment you want to, fantasy. So you could even take Kit's book uh, and convert it into a fantasy world <laughs> um, and explore it with, in VR. So there's so many possibilities. And then also theaters. Um, there's not that many out there. I think there's a few beta testing ones. But eventually there'll be, like I talked about before, there'll be VR theaters. And once these start to come out in like a few years from now, you'll start to see the VR headset prices drop. And also as VR cameras become more competitive, and there's already a lot of competition out there with VR cameras, but as they start to perfect how the cameras work and they start to get, come out with 8K and 4K cameras, then you'll really see that price go down and go down and go down. Right now it's really affordable to, um, to watch 360 videos, of course. You can watch them basically for free. And it's really affordable to record in 360 video because you can buy a 360 camera for like $100 to $300 or you can even shoot 360 photography with your phone by using the Panorama setting and just having a tripod that spins around. So there's lots of different um, ways to do it and I think that's it's just going to grow, grow exponentially. Um, do you have anything to say on the matter, Kit? No, I think you covered most of what I was going to say. Uh, so I see two... Uh, 
large areas where we're going to see a reduction in the prices of VR headsets. Uh, one of them is as each generation comes out, the technology from the pre previous one will get better, and there will be more interest. And because right now the eight hundred dollar to a thousand dollar price tag on the PC headsets, and I think uh, the PlayStation VR is around five hundred, much lower, but. All of these still require that you get another expensive rig, either a PlayStation or a really expensive computer. And so at the moment, it's extremely restrictive. But also at the moment, a lot of virtual reality for the PC or sitting on the couch is um, a very bleeding edge, which is why a lot of people in the VR industry think that it's going to primarily take off on mobile devices. Because, well, if you already own a phone, you own something that is capable of doing rudimentary virtual reality. And so with just a 50 or or $100 headset or even something as cheap as uh, Google Cardboard, you can have a reasonably good VR experience. And so it's it'll become kind of like the separation between people who want just a headset for watching stuff and listening to things, you know, like uh, like pairs of headphones versus the audiophiles who, or people who want a really powerful virtual reality experience who are willing to, to pay the really for the really expensive stuff. Uh, and the other thing that will probably drive it is right now there's a chicken and egg problem with uh, VR content. A lot of content for producers in the very professional areas are concerned that there might not be that many, that much of an audience yet. So uh, as a result of seeming to be expensive, as more virtual reality devices move into homes and people are actually able to afford them and start buying them even at higher price points, more content creators will push to make more content, which in turn will drive manufacturers to bring prices down because then people will be more willing to buy their devices to get at the, the uh, extra content. So one of the things that I'm seeing VR uh, experts saying right now is they're hoping at some point there will become – there'll be a feedback loop between people being able, people getting uh, VR equipment and content producers making content that's interesting to people buying VR equipment that will then drive prices down and bring more virtual reality into living rooms uh, and onto the bus or wherever. And that's why I think it's like really cool that um, YouTube really is investing in VR and 360 and so is Facebook. I mean, these, these pioneers... Um, they, they, they're really embracing VR and they're really doing a lot of research in the field and trying to get it moving forward. Uh, as you can see, uh, Ke Kevin had to go. Um, I wanted to say thank you for joining us, Kevin, but he had to leave. Um, I think we're almost running out of time, but I do want to get these two last questions before we go. Um, Kit, you talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, Phil Peterson, he asked him, how are the stitch lines on the Rico Theta S? Um, I mean, uh, as you can see from the video, um, they were they were pretty good, I thought. Uh, what did you think, Kit? Yeah, you, I mean, you can barely see them at a distance because, it, and once again, it's that uh, it's that focal length blind spot problem when you have two cameras that the camera can't see immediately right next to it because, well, I mean, it's blinded by by its own edges. Uh, but the further away you get, the better the stitch lines become. Although I, I haven't played with it personally, but I'm used to cameras like. A lot of the time, the problem with the stitch lines is that they don't react well to extreme motion. And so that's when they're going to become the most visible, is the closer you are and the faster the camera is moving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I noticed that, like, you're right, if you're close to this, the, the Rico, then the stitch lines become really obvious, and as you back up, it becomes a little bit better. And I think, I think that's going to be, like, um, you know, I think that's one of the hardest things to overcome in VR for the longest time, was kind of creating that software that would stitch it. And for a long time, VR have been, well, 360 video has been out for like, I don't know, four or five, for a long, for, for since camera's been out, of course, but, but it's been really like working in that software area for a long time. For a long time, people were making their own rigs with GoPros and with other cameras and experimenting with it. And it was kind of in this, in that, um, its own little world of developers and programmers, people who are interested in it and they were like experimenting around with it. And they came up with a lot of really cool ways. And now it's really fascinating because you could just basically use Adobe Premiere. You know, Adobe Premiere has, has its own way of editing and putting together 360 videos. So now you don't need to do all this complicated programming or know all this complicated programming stuff in order to, um, 
work with VR. So it's really cool. And so I think, I think the Ricoh is a good camera. I would definitely recommend looking into more cameras that are coming out soon because there's probably going to be a better camera that comes out that competes with the Ricoh. And I recently heard of the Ricoh Theta SC. So I think they're coming out with a new version of the Ricoh Theta S. And also the latest update of the Ricoh Theta S, I noticed, increased the recording time from 30 minutes to an hour. So I'm not sure if they, if they improved their compression software or what that was. Do you, do you have any idea about that, Kit? No, I, I'm not, not familiar. Okay, yeah, because I couldn't find anything on it. I did lots of research and I couldn't. So if my audience knows something about that, let me know. Um, because it was really interesting because isn't like they, they must have really in, increased their compression software if, if that's the case because that, that's pretty it's pretty significant um, so we have one last question anonymous asks um, he he wants he has suggested a uh, lesson for the future he asked him to go over basic settings of a regular camera sometimes and I'm really glad you asked that anonymous person um, because next week we are um, having a uh, class called uh, shooting like a professional and this will be a ThinkSpot class, but it will also be live on this channel. And so you can you can come in person, you can register online at thinkspot.org, um, or you can just walk in. Usually we don't have everyone who show, usually usually there's room in the class for people to show up. So ho hopefully hopefully there'll be enough room. But I would definitely recommend registering if you if you can. And uh, you can ask questions on social media or in person. And I I encourage submitting questions throughout the week. And basically, we'll be going over ISO, aperture, shutter speed, everything to do with um, you know how manual settings work in a camera and how to really control your image and how to get the shot you want for the environment you're in. And this will this will go over to 360 video because like in the Ricoh Theta S, you can control many many aspects of that. You can't control your f-stop in the Ricoh Theta S; it's at 2.0 and it stays at that. Um, but you can control your other settings. And uh, so it's really cool. And I've, I noticed that's an issue because the focus is very shallow in video on the Ricoh Theta S. Everything really far away is out of focus um, or blurry. Um, so that's an issue with the Ricoh Theta S as well. But but, it, but with photography, everything's in focus and it's nice and good. Yeah, so um, do you have anything else to add, Kit? Do you think we have any other questions that we want to answer ourselves? I think we covered everything. No. And we're, we're out of time yeah, I here, I think. So I we're... Think has been covered pretty thoroughly. Exactly. So I think I think we're good. If you have any questions, you're still welcome to submit them on social media, and I'll answer them later. Um, I'm, uh, over chat or tomorrow, I'll be rebroadcasting this exact episode, and then um, and there you can uh, I'll be answering questions directly, um, and I'll be doing rebroadcast tomorrow. Usually, I'll, Fridays will be a different episode, but tomorrow I'll be doing a rebroadcast of the same thing. Um, so we're gonna go. We're going to go to the closing thing, so I'm going to do a little forecast here. So we have, um, like I said, next week is, uh, um, first, before I, before I do the forecast, I want to say goodbye to Kit. So Kit, thank you for joining us so much. It was nice to have you, um, and I hope to, hope to see you in the future, and hopefully we'll have you on again. Um, oh, yeah, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, exactly. And every, all links to Kit Dotson's um, you know, articles he writes, his, uh, his YouTube and his Twitch stream is all in the description below. And his YouTube is even in the corner. There's a little info button, a card, and you can click up on his YouTube there. I think it's on this side of the video. Um, and so you can you can get to him in that many different ways. Uh, one, one, one second. I need to plug in the battery here on this laptop. It's going to die. Ah. Okay. So anyway, let's do the show forecast. And uh, thank you for joining us, Kit. And I'll see you later. Goodbye. Okay. So... Um, as I said, next week we have uh, shooting like a professional, um, and so we'll be we recording that live, and we'll also have a discussion on Friday about that. We'll have a discussion on general cameras and how cameras operate, and we'll answer questions. Uh, any questions we didn't get to Thursday morning during that lesson, we'll discuss on Friday, and I'll try to get a guest down by next next week, um, you know, uh, and everything like that. Uh, and I also have coming up, I have a um, business of prison series. Let's see. Coming up in the um, in the uh, uh, soon. Um, can't seem to be playing the promo here. It's not playing, but I'll I'll upload that separately. I have a little promo that I'll show. But the business of prison documentary series is basically about breaking stereotypes with the, in the prison industry. So I look forward to that coming out in the next month or so. Um, and basically, we interview tons of uh, ex felons 
on their experience in prison and what they experienced. And we really break stereotypes and kind of break what st- what prison is all about, what people think prison is all about. And we, we address it from a different point of view. And we really address the issues with prisons and how we can improve our prison system and so forth. So I think that's something we really need to improve um, in our world. Um, so I'm gonna clo- I'm gonna we're gonna close and with a with a with a closing statement. Um, and we're almost done here. So yeah, thank you for joining us and uh, see you next time. This was the Q and A Tech School. And join us tomorrow at three o'clock for a rebroadcast, and next week at eleven for. Um, Shooting Like a Professional with Manual Settings. I'm your host, Jonathan Kyle Hobson. And this was the Q&A Tech School. You can find us on social media. We're on Facebook, YouTube. We're also, we'll be uploading these podcasts to SoundCloud. And we'll soon be on iTunes.